So again, my name is Philip Martin, and I'm the co-owner of Philip Martin Gallery with Portia Hine. And I hope that you've had a chance to meet her either at the gallery or at the fairs. I'm super excited about the conversation today with Christy Matson, whose show, The Cloud, is uh, the subject of an exhibition currently at the gallery. It's really a thrill for me to be doing this exhibition. The works are fantastic and they get into a lot of interesting areas and I'm really excited to be working with you, Christy. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, how are you? I'm doing well. It's uh, continuing to be a little cloudy here in Southern California, but it's been a fun summer so far. So, so yeah. So this is a really exciting show. I don't know where you wanna start. You wanna talk a little bit about the works or the title or some of the things you were thinking about. Where, where does this show find you in your practice? Um, well, I think that my practice, I mean, I've been making work for about 20 years now. And so I think about like what I do is kind of like rolling from one thing to another. And so, you know, when you ask me like where this show, where does it find me in my practice? This finds me like right here, right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the questions that came up at the opening from a number of people was, oh, how long, you know, how long did it take you to make this? And I think, um, with the exception of one sort of secret work that's hiding, in the office space, um, yeah. everything in this exhibition um, has been made, I, I guess we could say like this academic year. So I think yeah. maybe the oldest piece um, in this grouping was made in like October, um, September, October of 2022. So, um, you know, where we are is like right where I'm kind of like poking around inside my head at this particular moment in time. Um, and, uh, Everything that we're looking at here is made in my studio. It's all made on the loom, which is over my shoulder right here. Um, and uh, for the last really like 20 years now, I've been working with um, this loom or a version of this loom to create these kind of, um, I think we decided to call them wall mounted um, woven pictures. Yes, yes. And, yeah. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm not, quite sure exactly where where we should jump in um, aside from like this is where I'm at right at this particular moment in time <laughs> all right well I'm at my MFA is in painting and of course I see a lot of interconnections with painting and I'm sure you do too and oh, well of course you do do you want to talk a little bit about the jacquard loom and sort of just for people who are maybe not from fibers like what what is the jacquard loom yeah that's a great question great place to start um so the jacquard loom was invented in France, south of France, um, in the early 1800s. And it was really a revolutionary machine or revolutionary device because unlike any loom that ever existed before it, um, you can operate every single thread on this loom independently. Um, and so that allows whoever's weaving on it to create what appear to be organic lines um, or things that maybe, um, you know, at the time it would they would have been used to create like um, decorative floral curtains, that sort of thing. You know, always thinking about functional textiles. Um, and so unlike any loom that had existed before it, where you were working in like groups of four or eight or 16, you know, um, this is a really important piece of equipment because for the first time it allowed um, through the use of punch cards, you could create like a drawing on paper and then translate it into a woven image through the technology of this specific loom. Which is um, something you my, do in your, in your practice. Exactly, yeah. And I don't use punch cards anymore. <laughs> yeah. um, but at this point, it's all like through, through, working through the computer and then everything is made by hand. I'm weaving by hand on the loom um, to build up these images. But it is through um, the sort of mediation of the computer that helps me keep track of what I'm doing as I go. And so it's kind of interesting because I think, you know, you have a certain kind of give and take. And I think, you know, it's interesting because of course the Jacquard loom is seen as an originator of modern computers. You can kind of, in a certain sense, offload your brain and put it in this card and bring it out later. But of course, like any artist, I mean, really it's just the interaction with a tool, whether it's a pencil or a paintbrush or a chisel, there's always this question of figuring, so to speak. Like how does that idea become realized uh, in in the, the object and that's going to happen of course through through your skill and and also through your seeing possibilities and you want to talk just a little bit about that because of course you work with you know with from 
from colored works on paper. You know, you start with them. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, the loom really is just a tool, as you mentioned, um, in the same way that like all artists have tools that they work with. And sometimes that tool might just be your hands. Sometimes it's a paintbrush. Sometimes it is a chisel. Um, and I think that like different tools allow us to have a different level of agency over what it is that we're making. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, you know, a lot of my work is just mediated or the agency is mediated through the tools. Um, but I don't think that that um, really changes the way that I'm able mm -hmm. to make things. And so mm -hmm. for me, it's a really exciting kind of give and take to think between like, okay, I work on paper as a starting point. And then things get um, translated through the computer in a whole variety of different ways. Um, and that kind of changes the work. It allows me to kind of think about um, the kind of give and take of working in a very analog way and a very digital way. And it's all kind of a form of collage, I think about, mm -hmm. um, that allows me to kind of arrive at these final compositions. Um, and so like, I mean, I actually, I don't know if it really makes sense for me to like, Show yeah, things no, here. Totally but, makes but sense. like, and <laughs> yeah, actually, I'm, I'm like, do, I'm like, do I have that exact drawing sitting right here since it's up on the screen? So sometimes I'll start with something that might look like, I think this is that one. Something and that's that, a, like, is that a, that's just a pastel drawing that we're looking at. Exactly. It's like yeah. an oil pastel drawing yeah. on, you know, just like sometimes it's right. scrap paper. Yeah. I mean, very often, like, I'll just have something that I need to jot down and it might just be like on a notebook yeah. or sometimes it's even on like a napkin. It's like whatever's at hand very often. So there's a real like kind of quickness or an immediacy to the way I like to sketch. Um, and I think that a lot of artists do that where it's like, I, I just, something's in my head and I got to get it down right now. Mm -hmm. um, but because I, I sort of understand that those sketches are kind of like a roadmap, it sort of doesn't really matter right. how they, how they start. Um, yeah. And I very, I very seldom show them too. I mean, sure. like if you came to my studio, I'm happy to like pin them up on the wall or talk about them and show them, but I don't, very often show them in an exhibition context. Yeah. Um, but it's through then working with the computer in a whole variety of different ways. And that, right. you know, I started doing that in the early 2000s where I was working with like um, taking some kind of starting point and I upload it into the computer and play with something like Max MSP and generate patterns or mm -hmm. generate different ways of, of translating the image through algorithms. Um, that I started working in Photoshop and sometimes right. it's about like collage collaging or layering or taking, you know, maybe the, the sketches on paper and then photographs and kind of blending them all together or played around with different types of machine learning as well yeah. to kind of create generations. So for me, it's all just like kind of a mushy um, way of like arriving at this final thing that yeah. I'm then going to go weave if that makes yeah. sense. Well, so it's really about like a blending. It's kind of fun because I, I remember in grad school, we were get I would, there was one particular uh, sculptor who was always harassing me about sculptor time versus painting time. Whereas mm -hmm. in painting time, it's like, have idea, execute idea. <laughs> like three, right. three hours later, done with idea. Sculptor time is like, okay, we have to really figure this out. And I like your phrase roadmap because it's this different kind of process where you have moments of of quick flashes of, I'm sure, of creativity and quick action. And then you have to see how that's interpreted by the thing you're working with. And then you have to tell the thing you're working with, actually, I, this interpretation is not right. I mean, what about all these different moments just getting into it for, you know, what are we seeing in terms of some of these kinds of interactions between colors, shapes, like what is the matrix and how is this kind of happening? Well, there's there's so many different matrices all kind of coming <laughs> together right here, <laughs> literally and figuratively. So, right, 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 um, right. But like, uh, you know, zooming in right here, we're sort of looking at like the collision of mm -hmm. sort of a red tone and a darker mm -hmm. blue and a lighter blue. And for the last number of years, I've been working with a painted paper material yeah. as well. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so there's that level in addition to kind of the the roadmap that I sort of talked about as well, mm -hmm. where I, I think about, you know, I'll make a roadmap, I'll make kind of a digital plan. And then I have this sort of, we come back to kind of like the analog world again, yeah where I, I work with this um, white paper material uh -huh. um, and then I paint it. And so, you know, I get all these sort of like different variations of like shades of green and the way mm -hmm. the paper twists and the way it absorbs paper, I'm sorry, the paint. Mm -hmm. It kind of gives this really lovely sort of tonal um, quality to the materials. And so there's that level as well. And then when all of these things come together, 
it's like the the meeting of these different matrices, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and that and it's through um, kind of drafting structures as well. So I think we've we've also talked about um, that there's almost a level of of um, engineering that happens yeah. that really um, I, I tend to kind of gloss over when I'm yeah. describing what I do because it, it's sure. like really, really technical. Right. Um, but but that that's really what allows me to create like that moment where all these different colors come together and yeah. and what feels like, you know, like, oh, I've kind of like colored in that that section. And when you're talking about painting, you're talking about prior to the weaving process. Correct. Um, yeah. Another thing that's yeah. interesting about the work too is like what edge means. You know, edge is such an issue in say all over abstraction, which is what this reminds me yeah. of. I mean, what about some of these edges? Like how where <laughs> where is is like in this whole in these interactions? Well, I think that's a really great question. And I think about edges all the time. Right. Um and so I think like literally, I can you zoom in on an edge yeah. in that image that we're let's, looking at let's there. Do it. Yeah. Um so like there's literally the edge of where maybe that like blue butts up against the red but then maybe if you could scroll over in the image to the actual edge of the piece so there's sort of like a two-dimensional edge and then there's right. also a three-dimensional edge um and it, in textiles we refer to the edge of a piece of cloth as a selvage okay um, and so so for me i think a selvage is uh, or like a hand woven selvage is very similar to like if you were making paper by mm -hmm. hand where you have that kind of like deckled edge where right. it's really irregular and it speaks to the inconsistency of the hand. Um, right. If I were a machine, I would make a perfect edge. Um, if I were a, a painter working with canvas that was right off the roll, you'd have that perfect edge Right. Um, because it's a mass produced edge. But I really, for me, those edges are super interesting because yeah. that also spe speaks kind of to a larger kind of like metaphorical edge, yeah. if you will. Sure. Um, and sort of like the boundaries between different types of media or different sorts of experiences, um, maybe the the boundaries or the edges between something registering as uh, figurative or something right. registering as completely abstract. Um, and so I really, for me, I really love the way that those things all kind of meet up. And sometimes there's a real fuzziness to it. And sometimes the edges are really crisp, just like in real life. Yeah. Well, I mean, edge at a certain point is where definition happens or control or any number of ways of trying to. Yeah. Now, a next question is, so is this area down here? Is this is this, again, a legacy of what you called the an overshot? Um, that one is similar to an overshot. Um, so an overshot is a really technical weaving term. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a it's a category of specific types of weave structure and actually mm -hmm. to be you know for anybody who's tuning in who's like a, a really hardcore weaving nerd out there technically <laughs> yeah. all of weaving these we, there are many of those oh i, mean, um, I know there I are. Count myself they, come to, like, they come to your show and they ask me questions and about one minute in i'm like i think you know more about this medium than i do <laughs> well it's high it's highly highly technical in that way um so technically the everything in this is an overshot, but okay. there's very specific, there's a very specific yeah. type of patterning that I yeah. think references that. Here, I think this is referencing um, a plaid more than yeah. that specific type of pattern. So, you know, when I mentioned earlier, I have a, a sort of collaging practice yeah. as well, or a process, like that would be an example where I sometimes will go in, like the drawing did not have that kind of yeah. plaid in it, but I'll come in after the fact and kind of work in certain areas where I want to reference a specific pattern. And I think for me, like those sorts of patterns or decorations or things that reference um, maybe like, you know, plaid, I think about plaid shirts all yeah. the time, like those, um, but th those things sort of implicitly reference the body in this very kind of like specific yeah. haptic sort of way, which is why I will often insert those um, sort of gestures into the overall composition. Well, one thing you said that stuck in my mind, and I believe it's from the first piece actually that we looked at with regard to the overshot or where it came, where I heard it, is you made a comment that perhaps with overshot and referring to certain historical patterns, you made the point that an overshot was, a, if I understood it correctly, was a kind of pattern that allowed people to have image on both sides of the piece of, of fabric. And at a time prior to mass media, I'm envisioning Little House on the Prairie, where yeah. image was this thing that people wanted so badly 
the overshot right. was a way to create image and to do that. And somehow, you know, we're, I thought that was a very interesting conceptual aspect to your work and also to this, the history of fibers and cloth. And yeah, all. absolutely. No, and I think for me, I, I think about that often is that I'm working in a very historical medium that has been around for thousands of years. Yeah. Um, and that there's something really remarkable about the fact that if we go back in history, we look all over the world and human beings who were not in, in contact with one another in very disparate parts of the world that figured out how to make some version of woven cloth. And, you know, Overshot is a really great example of a kind of a version of a technique that we see popping up again, all over the world. We don't really know where its origins come from because we mm. cloth, cloth disintegrates, so we don't have great um, archeological evidence. Yeah. Um, but I think that there is a human desire that has existed for thousands and thousands of years to have um, objects in our lives uh, that have patterning or have decoration, if you will. And I think, yeah. you know, your, your example of sort of like, you know, like Little House on the Prairie. I mean, I, I <laughs> probably if we went, probably if we went back and watched that TV show, I bet that they would have an overshot quilt on their bed. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, I think that there's, there's also like, a, it's a really cool, like summer and winter is another type of textile pattern that really allows you to maximize by having like a two-sided cloth. Right. And if you think about like a moment in history where, you know, you couldn't go to a place like Joanne Fabrics or Walmart right. and buy a bolt of fabric, if everything that you are using in a functional sense had to be made um, by hand, I think you would think very carefully about the things that you wanted to surround yourself with. Yeah. Well, it's very interesting because, I mean, again, you know, here we are talking about you know, ancient um, human practices across the world with regard to uh, fabrics. And obviously you have the, the, history, the history of writing itself and when this is coming about. Um, and then here we are. And so we're talking, you know, thousands of years ago. I, I, what is that? Something like uh, this, if someone's going to write in, but 3,000 3, BC or something like that, I guess. I think, is that right? I don't quite remember. Anyway, um, and then <laughs> that's fine. We're trying. I'm trying. Yeah. I can look it up. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then also, of course, you have here we are having a conversation about the com this also about the computer. Um, yes. Given that the same desire to to outsource writing or to outsource systems is then now right. the forming aspect of our contemporary life. And I think that's one thing that's really fascinating about your work and also about fibers, as you've helped me come to understand it, is you have this. It there's these moments where it feels like a craft medium to those of us who maybe don't know a lot about it or, and then of course, and that's a rich history and very, very exciting yep. and valid. Yep. But then also yep. it's like a totally hardcore conceptual medium, given that so much conceptual art is about process and systems and things like that. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the history of this loom in particular is really fascinating, both, mm -hmm. you know, when we're going back talking about the early 1800s, like its role in, sort of the development of the entire industrial revolution and yeah. how that ties into issues around labor practices. Yeah. Um, and then also, and, and, you know, also, yeah, that's, that's its own kind of can of worms, yeah, yeah, but yeah. then, you know, this also being, this also being the, the predecessor to the modern digital computer. And I think about like in the last 20 years, the way that our lives on a day-to-day -day basis have changed so rapidly, um, yeah. you know, like, and how that ties into issues of like climate change and AI and, and just like the prevalence of social media. I mean, those were things that were, you know, kind of like maybe on the back burner 20 years ago, but it's yeah. like the speed at which um, technology has kind of like come crashing into all of our lives for better or worse. I think particularly because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's pretty hard to ignore um, the relationship between our everyday lives, um, at least the way that that I live in this country, yeah. in the city, um, without having, you know, <laughs> the, the computer as like, or the computer or the smartphone or whatever as being like a really um, driving force in my in my everyday life. Yeah. So, well, again, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's again why I, I keep coming back at this very moment to painting and other kinds of, you know, fibers, the importance of this, of human expression and and that you know and these are they seems like the most radical uh, mediums to me because it's ways in which the entire world is communicating with one another on an even basis. 
people have everyone has hand making traditions and ways that they express themselves directly and it's ways that makers and viewers can communicate with one another in a way that i think um is is just incredibly exciting for me i'm just constantly i just amazed by all the stuff i can see that i didn't get to see 20 or 30 years ago because of for a variety of hierarchical reasons or maybe it was technology i don't know now, what yeah. about, you know, a piece like this is a gorgeous, gorgeous piece. And when I look at it, you know, of course, it feels like it's flowers. It almost feels like, a, you know, it, how how does something like that come together in terms of building images in your in your own work or, you know, so, yeah. sort of look almost like landscape? Yeah, well, I think that it kind of comes back to your question about edges, where I'm really yeah. interested in, mm. in that kind of edge where something yeah. maybe feels like reminiscent of uh, maybe you're looking at the ocean here, maybe mm -hmm. that's the sunset, maybe those are hillsides. Um, I mean, I think it's really hard for me to kind of go throughout my day without just being in constant awe of this landscape that we <laughs> live in in Los Angeles. Sure. Um, I mean, I left my studio yesterday and I mean, there's just like this whole row of trees right along the 101 free day, freeway. I mean, it's so polluted. There's so much trash, but it is like the most spectacular row of blooming trees like yeah. two blocks from from where I am right here yeah and I think that I am constantly filtering through images and so yeah. when I think about like building something like this it's really about that kind of edge between what I'm seeing that's flying by me in my daily life things that kind of stick and that I'm trying to like kind of again collage them all together into a yeah. way that may maybe references maybe references a landscape but also maybe doesn't and that yeah. there's also something that feels really like um fictional about it that it's yeah. not meant it's not meant to be like oh yeah that's this specific hillside in Malibu and that's the ocean and the sunset there's none of that like there's none of that kind right. of level of specificity right. to it um and I think that that also comes through this idea of like just this kind of like constant barrage whether it's through just like you know seeing images online driving through landscapes but also you know we spend a lot of time hiking I yeah. run a lot so the way that I sort of uh filter landscape um when you're going by at a, the speed of being on foot versus sure. the speed of being in a car and sure. so like for me it's all kind of like a way of sort of collaging that lived experience into yeah. something that I hope references everything that I see around me but not in a way that you could pinpoint oh, that's this. And some of like, like before you move on from this image, like in that top right there, there's this like kind of really bright pink color. Yes. And like something like that might be a reference to like, you know, living in LA, there is just sort of all of this like stock of all that bougainvillea that we see like yeah. all over the all over the fences, you know, all over the ground, kind of butting up against that really kind of like washed out kind of concrete yeah. color. Um, so that was just an example. And before you moved on from that one, um, well, it's something as a way that you, to... you do that I think is one of the things that at hearing you talk is very enjoyable about the work itself is that you are, I think, very generous and open to interpretation in terms of how people read the work. I don't think I would call the work abstract or not abstract. I don't think I would call it representational in some specific way or not representational. It just you seem to be very comfortable with your viewers giving this very open kind of experience for um, interpretation in this particular body of work. I mean, there are other yeah. other pieces and I can move to the secret piece in the office because it is here at the end. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I think that's one of the things that I really find really exci exciting about it is that there's questions answered, but the way in which they're answered really seems to really allow people to have exploration to encourage them to ask their own questions, which is thrilling. Well, and I think, thank you for saying that. I, I, I feel like I'm actually less interested in answering questions than I am asking questions. Yeah. And so um, I would rather create something that's sort of very open-ended in that way, instead of like pinpointing. Yeah. Like this is what it is. This is also fun to come back to because I think through seeing the Henry VIII show at the Met or there's a, a few other things I've seen recently. I've, I've seen a lot. Well, maybe up at the Huntington recently. I've seen a lot of medieval tapestries recently. Mm -hmm. And um, 
there's something about this and your color that is interesting because I think uh, that, I don't know, it, it ties in. Sometimes with those tapestries too, I had interpreted them as faded, but I now realize right. from talking to you that 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 there's a, that color, um, what would you call it? Co not reduction, but there is a certain, like because of how mixing. tapestries work, you have color, yeah, color mixing, there you go. Yep, yep, yeah. So there is always, I mean, sometimes with those tapestries that, you know, they actually are a little faded. Like if you flipped them over to the back, but for the most part, there is, because of the way a, a weaving has to be constructed, very often you have a blending of the ground yeah. and the figure together in a way. And because that, of know, the the way that we've got this thing going in the actual. Exactly. Itself. Yeah. The weft. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it's like, it's those, those two things are always operating in relationship to yeah. one another. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there's a certain kind of, um, I don't know. I mean, I could work with with a uh, ground that is much more saturated, but I really like having that kind of like washed out sort of quality to it. And that's something yeah. that I'm always kind of seeking. And in yeah. fact, that's part of the reason why I don't show the drawings very often because they're almost too saturated for me. I like, yeah. the, I'm able to kind of like step them down once they're woven. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Is there anything that that maybe we haven't talked about that you might want to talk about, or any what any other thoughts or things we should we should get, we should get on before we leave? I mean, I, I'm sure there's a million things. I feel like <laughs> I, I, I feel like it's so hard to I think the, the the breadth of things that I'm interested in and that yeah. I want to bring to the work feels sure. like so such a huge amount that it's always really hard to like kind of wrap it up neatly in a 20 minute yeah. chat. Sure. Um, but I, but I do really appreciate the opportunity to kind of, um, you know, speak broadly about the yeah. works in the show. And it's been really great to be able to see them in your space and, um, you know, knowing so many people in LA to have them come by and see it too. It's really great because I, I do think that a lot of these pieces, there's something that is communicated through seeing them in person that is of really course. just almost impossible to be able to communicate through the screen. Yeah. Well, and I guess along those lines, I would say that I think that that's another thing that I really um, appreciate is the through like works that I like to see and that I hope I'm able to communicate in my own work too is yeah. the idea of close looking and that like if you step back you're rewarded by a certain kind of overall composition but if you can also kind of like zoom yeah, in like totally. the closer that you can get to something there's also something to be gained um, from getting up close. Well, that be you get into the whole digitization of, so to speak, of the whole thing in terms of the little little pieces and parts. Um, so yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Well, um, thank you very much for joining me for the conversation, and thank you to everybody for tuning tuning in, so to speak, today. Um, it's uh, the show of Christy Matson's work is on view through July eighth, uh, alongside a remarkable show by Christy Luck called "Close to the Verb." We'll do a webinar with Christy Luck um, later. And um, we love our new location in Glassell Park. So send me an email if you see something in the webinar that you like or stop by. It's a great location. You can go to Lemon Poppy, great to get, get a great coffee. You don't have to sit in traffic. We have a great time and we get tons of people. The thing that I love about the space is that there's both so many artists and makers for whom you know, seeing work in person is really important. And then we also get to see all the people that want to come and visit those makers because there's so many studios nearby and you can go to the Norton Simon. And anyway, it's very fun. These are very visually enriching shows. So, and you don't have to sit in traffic, but that's nice. Um, that's hard. Anything else? So that's great, Christy. I really appreciate it. Have a great uh, um, morning. Thank you, Philip. I really appreciate it. It was great chatting with you. Yeah. All right. Take care. Bye. <laughs>